tighter. Tight like my grip on reality. Ha ha ha! Irony. Now, I think it's time for a little bounce light. And with it, we can make that core shadow stronger. With how hot everything else in the scene is, I'm going to opt for a red-violet bounce light. And just a little bit more cleanup here and there. Now, let's see what happens if we apply our black and white overlay trick. As always, we need to balance the effect so that it doesn't overpower things. I also feel like I want more of that background color to reflect in the surface, so I'm grabbing that color, adding a solid color fill layer, and faintly applying it as a screen type layer. For the dull, but maybe still slightly metallic headdress, first we're going to fill in where we slopped over it earlier. I'm going for a dark mid-tone, and we'll add the highlights and the occlusion shadows later. I want to keep that subtle variation of color, so I'm continually grabbing from the canvas with the eyedropper. Now, I think we'll go ahead and super fast zip through this too. Um, I'm making sure to maintain the lighting scheme and not to lose the form, but other than that I'm just painting over the mess. I've made a selection from what I just painted. This is one of the reasons why I end up with tons of layers and create a pattern fill of that original paper texture, make it an overlay, adjust the fill to taste, and leave it above where we will be painting. I'm just gonna clean up this mask a little bit. I probably overused this trick, but I am going to copy the channel with the best looking values and use it to bring the contrast up a little. I'm going to grab another custom brush to add a pitted, dented look. Uh, it looks like this. Remember our vocab for today? Planishing! I'm painting on an overlay layer to keep this effect subtle. One thing to remember about surface texture that comes from irregularities of shape is that you don't see much in shadow, you see some in light, you see the most in transition to shadow. Which should make total sense if you think about it, but it's important to keep in mind because an evenly applied texture looks super fake. Now we're back to a regular layer and a regular brush. And I'm just adding in some highlights and trying not to make smooth marks. This thing is dented and rough and pitted after all. Riddled with character and history. Like Robert Redford's face. True story, my grandpa broke Mr. Redford's nose once. It was an accident, but still, and Robert was totally gracious about it. He's a really nice guy. Throughout all my paintings, I'm primarily thinking in terms of the light sources. I often paint dark to light, adding value and color where light would hit something, and I barely even worry about the rest. Shadows usually look better with only vague detail in them anyway. You've probably heard this before many, many times but avoid black, avoid white. Pure black and pure white have no color temperature. They tend to flatten and they often feel out of place. Don't be lazy and just add white to lighten something. It usually just muddies things up. Our perception of color changes with value. We perceive more saturation in shadows than in highlights, and the hue tends to move through the spectrum toward yellow as value increases. So. If you don't know what color you need to make something look lighter, a good place to start is increase the brightness, decrease the saturation, and move the hue slider just a touch toward yellow. See how that looks and adjust from there. And of course, do the reverse for darker tones. As I go, I clean up little things that I've missed. I don't like to stay in one area too long because I start to lose the big picture if I do. I'm also going to darken this stuff behind the headdress. It's starting to throw me off. Another victory for layers! I will just get rid of this glaring white with a darkened type layer. I love layers so effing much. All right, prime your squealing glands because I think we are ready for fire. First, make a group. 
change it to a screen type. Put a layer in there and fill it with black. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why would I have a layer of pure black in a screen type group? Well, my curious apprentice, you just shut your filthy interrupting mouth and wait for it, all right? Anyway, make a new layer and I'm going to paint on it with another custom brush to cruelly tease you with, one of my fire brushes, which looks like this before applying the rest of the digital witch's brew. Make a gradient map to put at the very top. Make sure it goes all the way to black. I am going to use this fiery preset of mine. The bottom layer of black we put in gives us a full range of grayscales for the gradient map to weave its magic. And I'm also going to add a layer effect for the initial layers of fire. Again, I will cover this sort of stuff in another lesson. Now one thing to remember if you do use layer styles, even if you change the layer type, that won't change the way the effects are applied. If you want the whole layer, including effects, to act like a multiplier or a screen or whatever, then you need to put it in a group and change the group type to what you want. In yet another layer, I'm painting straight in without the effects. Where I get too much, I just flip the color to black and paint some of it back out. Now, let's add in some happy little embers. I'm going to use a brush that is essentially a scanned paint spatter from a toothbrush. Then erase out here and there to control the effect. Now select the stuff you just painted and once again apply the paper texture as an overlay. It just breaks things up a little bit more. Now we'll grab a soft airbrush and paint in some light bloom. This fire gets pretty bright too bright, so I'm gonna adjust the gradient map. Hooray! We made fire! We also made a mess. Add a mask to the group, invert it, and then paint the fire in where you need it. On a new screen type layer, on top of the fire, paint in some of that light bloom. Light bloom is a camera exposure effect, but we've gotten so used to seeing it that now things look a little out of place if they don't have it and it kind of just helps tie things together. To bring out the definition in that fire, let's paint some dark behind it. And to clean it off the headdress, we can just select the fire mask, invert it, and cut or erase. For a fire that's more directional or smaller, I use a brush that's a little more direct, a little less chaotic. Looks like this. Okay, I guess we should paint the eye before we close the chapter on fire. I'm pretty much repeating the process that I just showed you. I think it might be cool to have a line of fire coming out of the eye. Tidbit number two for today is that some early Greek thinkers explained vision as a type of fire. They postulated that there was a fire in the eye that was focused through the lens and cast a beam. Our eyesight was sensing what the beam touched. I think I like that. But for the sake of experimentation, let's try like a dark, shiny black eye. That, that's kind of cool too. But I like the fire beam better. Well, I think that's about all I've got time to show you today. I hope this has been mildly informative and hopefully not too excruciatingly boring. If you liked it and or you'd like to see more, drop me a line via the contact page on my website. Now, be warned, at times I get super crazy go nuts busy, and I thus become abominably slow in responding. But that's not always the case, and I do always answer all my email eventually. I would also recommend reading my frequently asked questions before you send me a question, but feel free to send me an email, and I will catch you in the next lesson. TTFN, my beloved minions.